Okay, so welcome to the Urban Tree Festival, Writing Wood Words with Electra Rhodes. Um, some of you might need an introduction to Electra, some of you may not need an introduction to Electra. The great news about Electra and I is that between us we've done about a dozen workshops online. So hopefully if uh, everything goes according to plan, which it should, um, uh, you'll get a great 90 minutes out of Electra. Uh, I'll just do a bit of uh, announcement at the front uh, very quickly, um, mainly to point out that uh, we had a writing competition earlier this year uh, for the festival. We came up with uh, our latest edition of Canopy 2022. I know there are some people in the room who entered that competition and um, there might be one or two shortlisted authors who appear in that book. But otherwise, one way you can support the Urban Tree Festival is you can purchase that from the festival shop, which is uh, on our web page. And I'll add a link to that um, at the end of the session. No more from me until the very end. So, Electra, over to you. Thank you, Andrew. And hello, everybody. Happy afternoon. I think it's is it Thursday. Happy Thursday afternoon. It is a total joy to see everybody. Um, and I, if you see me doing this, it's not just I'm doing sort of magic spells with words. I'm actually I use an iPad. So I'm sometimes I'm flicking the screen across because it works differently on Zoom to um, people using a, a laptop or something like that or a um, desktop. So I'm doing that sometimes. It's not because I'm trying to poke particular people either. Probably. I am a non-fiction writer primarily, but I also write a bit of fiction too. I write a mixture of very, very short, from sort of 50 words all the way up to about my non-fiction manuscript is about 100,000 words. So lots of experience doing lots of things. And occasionally I write columns or blogs or whatever I'm commissioned to write as well. I used to be columnist for Spelt magazine. Some of you will be familiar with that. We're going to have a wonderful 90 minutes where I'm going to do a little bit of the work, but you're going to do lots of the writing. And one of my favourite things is watching other people doing the writing. So that's exciting opportunity for me. And I hope by the end you'll come away with a piece in some kind of shape. I won't say it will be finished and polished, but it will be hopefully a springboard to um, at least one new piece of writing. What we're going to do is over the next 90 minutes, there's going to be a bit of warm up, first of all, something about short form creative nonfiction, something about nature writing specifically, and what makes for good nonfiction and nature writing. Then the bulk of the session is going to be in three parts. And this is this exciting thing that I do where we look at three stages of drafting something, what I call the gut draft, the head draft, and the heart draft. A couple of you who've been in workshops with me before will have heard me talk about this. We've got all new prompts for this section and I've been thinking about it some more. So it's gonna be new things. So you think you know what you're gonna get. You probably know some of it, but not all of it. Ooh, exciting. In the final part of the morning, morning, afternoon, it's morning for some of you, the afternoon and evening for others. In the final part, we'll be looking at topping, tailing and titling your piece to make it really crackle. A little bit about where to submit work because sometimes people come to these workshops thinking mm, I don't know I've got 600 words what shall I do with it and I've got some ideas for you a little tiny bit about submission guidelines I've just come off judging for two competitions and I have thoughts about this and people submitting work um, then a little tiny very tiny bit at the very end about what you might do next apart from going to other lovely sessions from the Urban Tree Festival. Does that sound like more or less what you expected? I can see two people, three people nodding. That's fantastic, oh my goodness. I taught something last Saturday for um, the Milton Keynes Literary Festival about nature writing, which was great. The morning session adults, fantastic. And everybody knew why they were there. We did it, everyone was happy. In the afternoon, we had older young people there so sort of 14 to 18 and I started at the beginning did my usual spiel woohoo yay and then said what do you think we're here for and they went not this and I thought oh my god they've all been conned by their parents and guardians to come to a writing session I hope you haven't been conned to come to a writing session and if you have you, you can kind of you know drift away no no um no shame if you do that all right so to start with 
I would like you to introduce yourself in the chat as a weather forecast. And you might be looking at me thinking, what? Yes, in the chat as a weather forecast, please. And then let's have a look and see what people have said. Oh, I'm a changeable wind. Oh, lovely. Yes, I like that a lot. I have to remember to move my screen up. Oh, growing warmer through the afternoon. Yes, I'm a gentle breeze. Oh, I'd like to be a gentle breeze. That sounds lovely. Mostly sunny with a risk of storms. I'm mainly sunny with occasional blotting clouds. Oh, I love these. These are super. What else have we got? Wonderful day. Sunny. Fantastic. I think I might be um, pollen count high, risk of breezes later. Oh, a spring morning, mostly sunny with some light rain. Lovely. Intergalactic star shower. Fantastic. I want to be an intergalactic star shower too. Oh, super duper. Four seasons in one day. Gosh, I lived in Northern Ireland for a while. They have four seasons in one day, very regularly. Do you know, I bought a new Macintosh when I was there and I wore it every single day that I lived there. It's great. I'm um, snowstorm on a hill, ebbing into mist. Lovely. I love the way things roll down hills as well. It's a beautiful thing to witness as long as you're not caught in the tail end of it. Super duper. I might happen to miss a couple, but I will try and keep an eye on the chat as it comes in. Wonderful. Okay, so... Short form creative nonfiction is generally regarded as being under a thousand words. It's sometimes called flash creative nonfiction or nonfiction. And um, people don't use the word flash, but they say very definitely under a thousand words. And there's a lot of different varieties out there. So um, Andrew didn't mention it, but recently, oh, in fact, tomorrow, I'm uh, part of a book launch for something which has got fairly short form travel writing in it. Um, and I've written short form nature, memoir, historic, political, food-based, social commentary, etc. Etc. cetera. is not a category in, you know, specifically just in general. There's a lot of different kinds of short form creative nonfiction out there and lots of opportunities to submit work if you're the kind of person who wants to write both for yourself but also in the hope that somebody else might read it one day. Now, nature writing specifically, and around trees even more specifically, there's a lot of different formats. If you went into a bookshop or a library, you would find things like diaries, calendars, memoirs, things in the form of epistolary, so letter-based. Um, if you are familiar with Gilbert White's A Natural History of Selborne, originally that was letters. It's sometimes been edited so it doesn't read like it, but it was letters from him um, to a, a variety of people. It might be an almanac. It might be a field guide to a particular species or to a particular group of things. It might be a history. It might be very species specific. It might be a biography. It might be a quest by somebody to collect. Uh, it's like Patrick Barkham's just finished doing all the butterflies in Britain. I, I kind of love that. Um, one of the quest things that I did, which I'm currently writing up, was that I went all over the Middle East and North Africa and round into Turkey and Greece, looking for something called Delhi Bal, which Aristotle describes. It's, um, in English, it's mad honey. It's honey made from rhododendron pollen. And so that my quest was to try and find it because it came out, you know, it existed 2000 years ago, but was anyone producing it now? I won't tell you the answer. That's like a spoiler alert or a trailer for something more. Okay, so lots of different kinds of nature writing and lots of different things specifically about trees. There's a lovely book just come out, which is a biography of the Great North Wood, which is absolutely smashing. Now, some of you will have come to this very experienced in writing about nature and some of you may be newer to it but I hope all of you have got some opinions <gasps> opinions goodness me on a Thursday afternoon I would love to hear some of your thoughts about what makes for good nature writing I'd love you to put it in the chat what makes for good nature writing and let's have a look at what we can come up with together so the reader feels as if they are there with you and it engages your five senses. 
that you might hear non-human voices, close observation and original descriptions. Are over quickly, not too descriptive, allowing the reader's imagination to run wild. Personal experience, an emotional connection, a little bit of knowledge to pass on. What else? It conveys a sense of wonder, not always, of course, but something I always appreciate. Writing that makes you see nature in a new light. Something which both celebrates the natural world and also acknowledges the threats to it. And I even add occasionally the threats from it. Not everything else is benign, including us as humans. Anything else? That's a lot from a lot of people. I'm not sure if everyone's had a chance. That's what I think. Yeah, super. Excellent. Now, when you're reading a piece of really short nature writing, there are some great examples out. Um, for example, The Guardian Country Diary is almost always a really good short bit of nature writing, sometimes specifically about trees and sometimes about other species and other encounters or other um, relationships in the natural world and the natural order. One of the things I love about The Guardian Country Diary is that I don't know what's coming next. It could be any of those categories of things that I mentioned. It, it isn't always um, a sort of a diary of an encounter between you and whatever it is out there, or it isn't always a kind of mini field guide to, I don't know, the Selendine or whatever. And I, I love its breadth. And they've just started recently doing um, a young person's country diary, which is written by younger people. So if you've got younger people in your lives, um, in whatever way, I'd encourage them to think about reading it and possibly submitting work to it as well. Because the more we get more people thinking of as nature writing as being for them, the better. It's something that I think about. I come into the category of underrepresented nature writing uh, writers. You know, I might be white, but I'm working class, I'm disabled, chronically ill, queer, and so on. So there are some things which make me underrepresented. Uh, the white bit, not so much. There's a lot of white writers writing fantastic nature writing, uh, but it doesn't make me underrepresented in any way. So, had a little think about what makes for good nonfiction writing. So, I'm going to get you to do some nonfiction writing. I'm going to give you three prompts and we'll do them one at a time. Um, and it's going to be only about five minutes to write to each prompt. And that's intentional. It's so that we don't get too bogged down in one piece and so that we really get on and see what we can write in that time. I'm not going to ask you to share whatever it is you write with the rest of the group, um, but I'm going to invite you to do some further work on it through the rest of the session. Everyone ready for their kind of like their first writing sprint? You know, I, I can see some, oh yes, yes I am. I am ready, that's super. Okay, I would like you to imagine that you are the chair of a fan club. And it's a fan club of a particular tree, a special tree. It might be uh, one of those trees that has got a, a tree preservation order on it. It might be one of those ones that made it into the 100 best British trees. It might be a tree you particularly love that is under threat and that you want to save and so on. What I would like you to do is write a letter to the fan club in your position as chair about the tree. Now, it, it might be that something's happening, a celebration or a threat or whatever, but you're gonna have five minutes to write a letter to the fan club about the tree. Okay, ready, steady, go. Questions in chat if there are any. And super duper. Fantastic. Wherever you got to, awesome job, awesome job. Don't worry about if you didn't get to the yours sincerely, yours faithfully, yours truthfully. Let's have a quick look at the 
they might know much about somebody's written to me saying well you know it's quite difficult if if they've already know much about the tree maybe they do maybe um writing to a fan club about a tree that they already know exists has to be you know how it is with fan clubs they already know about so and so and so and so or the thing quite a tricky thing to make it new and interesting we're going to come back to how you make something very familiar new and interesting later on okay don't worry about it too much if you got stuck on that one let's try this one i would like you to think of a particular tree that you know particular tree that you know and writing from the tree's point of view i would like you to describe its typical day so a tree's typical day from the tree's point of view and just five minutes on that as well. Okay. Fantastic. Can you believe it? That was five minutes already. Whew. Um, there's no way to say this without sounding like an exam. Please finish your sentence you're writing on. I'll draw it to a close. Okay, so third prompt. I'm going to put in the chat five words. Okay, so wood, water, earth, wind and fire. I'd like you to write just for five minutes and include each of those words five, uh, at least once, each of those five words at least once. And it doesn't have to be um, about a tree, it could be something else. But whatever you write you must include those words at least, each of those words at least once. Ready, steady, go. And fantastic, well done, well done. Goodness me. Now, for those of you who are feeling just a little bit, whew, you have written for 15 minutes fairly solidly. And if you're not in the habit of writing for 15 minutes fairly solidly, that's quite a lot to do first off. So I hope you remember to give yourself a little round of applause, just a small one, you know, little round, not as a big round comes later on. Okay, so. I would like you to have a look at the three drafts you've just written and choose the one that you feel has got the most going on that you like the best. Um, it's always good when you're working on at this stage to choose work that you like a bit. It, it doesn't have to be perfect, but quite often people um, throw themselves into working on the one that they think is the trickiest or the hardest or that they like the least as though writing and revision should be some kind of um, punishment or punitive exercise you can write things that you you're enjoying writing it's okay you have permission to enjoy enjoy the work as well as um be stretched by it or have a uh, a tough afternoon with it okay so choose the one that you like that you fancy doing some more work on and i would like you to answer one question to start with and that is and you're going to spend three minutes on this what's working in your piece what's working super smashing and I hope you really did look at it and say yes this is something that's going really well I like this in this piece I like it it's really important when you've done a generative draft a gut draft to look at it and say yeah pat on the back this is working well the next stage of course is to say well this is what I can do differently this is where oh, I quite like to tweak this I'd like you to spend three minutes same piece what might you do differently with it what what could bear some attention 
Okay. Super smart, super smart. A few things that need attention. At this stage, when we're doing a head draft, it's really good to go into our revisions clear sightedly, to be aware of what we're writing that's already working for us so that we don't get rid of it and be aware of what we could do differently and things that might be worth changing um, just a bit, sometimes tweaking, sometimes rewriting the whole thing. I was saying to somebody recently, it's my five week uh, creative nonfiction group, that I wrote a piece earlier this year, all about an archeological dig. I'm an archeologist in my, I was gonna say real life, but this is real life too, in part of my life. And I wrote this quite long piece about uh, an excavation I was on a few years ago. It's great, I loved it. And at the end I thought, yeah, super, well done me. And then I thought, actually it's lovely and I've written it beautifully, but it's really boring. Oh God, <laughs> it was 4,000 words of boring. So I rewrote it and I changed the point of view that I was writing from. And rather than writing it from the point of view of me, the archeologist in the first person, I wrote it from the point of view of something that was imminently about to be excavated. Suddenly, what had become really familiar and a bit dull and time teamish became something quite startling and unfamiliar, familiar and unfamiliar at the same time. Now, I'd written the whole of my draft. I'd gone through several stages and really worked into it to get that first, first generative, revised, beautiful draft, and then thought, it's still not enough. It's not enough, rewrote the whole thing. Now, in that process, I rewrote the point of view completely. I changed the point of view. Um, I still made it first person. So the narrative voice stayed the same. It was still I. I've occasionally written pieces in the second, the you. Um, that's quite a bit of a harder sell with competitions and journals. Things in the second person. It's a bit tougher. Third person, he, she, they, very popular. And then plurals, we, slightly harder. They also um, relatively easy. Although in an omniscient th um, third person, the omniscient they, people are, there are trends in reading and writing. And that seems to be a little tiny bit out of favor at the moment. Close person, close third person, they, seems to be quite popular still, but not, this omniscient, um, things like the book thief. I kind of love that, having that omniscient narrator who is also a character in their own right, but not everyone does. Okay, so changing the point of view, the narrative voice, the tense is also quite a fun thing to change. So if you've got it in the past tense, you might like to try changing it to the present tense. Present tense gives immediacy and urgency. Past tense, gives authority and weight. So it may depend on what kind of mood you want in your piece. Do you want it to feel urgent, snappy? Present tense will work for you very well. Do you want it to feel really solid? Past tense will do you lots of favors. Future tense, hard sell, but really effective. It's just hard to keep it all lined up. Um, getting a future tense all the way through is, is quite a tough call, but when you do it well, it's really, really effective. I wrote something last year, which was second person future. So you will, oh my God, that story got rejected seven times before someone accepted it into a journal. And I was like, I'm maybe never going to write future you again, but, but it had, I liked it. I still liked it. The other thing that you might be starting to look at and think, well, is this working for me or not? Is, are your opening lines and closing lines as strong as they could be? Quite often we write into a piece and it's worth getting rid of the first few lines and perhaps rewriting them entirely or just doing without them. 
sometimes it means getting rid of quite a bit. I wrote something recently where I realized about the first a thousand words was me writing into the narrative and I could get rid of them, which then gave me some lovely flexibility at the end. Quite often people end too late as well. Sometimes you can happily lose the last couple of sentences or even a paragraph and your piece is stronger for it. Okay, so I've talked about point of view, the narrative voice, the tense, the top and the tail of the piece. The other thing that you really want to be working for you, and it's good to revise at this stage, is the structure. Now, one of the things that happens with lots of creative nonfiction, particularly if it's short, is there's no arc to it. Now, you could use all kinds of things like there's um, there are different uh, organizing principles behind really effective speeches, for example, that you can find TED Talks um, advertise, this is how to do a good TED Talk. And if you're talking about a nonfiction subject, then having it in a particular sequence can work really effectively. Uh, and there's lots of Google uh, uh, search terms you can use, but things like um, structuring a speech is really good. Uh, and you will find ways to order your information that's effective. I like the Western story arc. It's, um, it's very popular, partly because people like Disney love it, but it's beginning, inciting incident, middle, crisis, resolution, basically those five stages. And that kind of simple structure and simple arc can get you an awfully long way in creative nonfiction in a way that, um, to ensure that a piece doesn't just feel like a vignette or a description, but that something, some movement is happening. Yes, I'll put them into the chat, the five stages, absolutely. Okay, so what I would like to invite you to do is to choose your 10, uh, your favorite one, again, that you want to do a bit more work on and choose one of these things to do some tweaking to it, maybe lose the top line, the end line, the point of view, shift the point of view, and so on. Do one of those things. So that's sounds okay, about 10 minutes to write that whilst I put the five stages into the, uh, the chat as well. Okay, so rewrite, doing one of those things, point of view, tense, narrative voice, structure, topping and tailing. And it's 2.50 now, so we'll, we'll do that until three. All right, super smashing people. Lovely, 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 lovely. Okay, that was 10 minutes. Can you believe it? That went so fast, I know. When you're revising, it goes very quickly. Generating can drag all the other way around, depending on what kind of writer you are. Okay, so at this point, what I would like you to do is look now again at the piece you've just written. What's changed for the better? Can you write your answer to that in about two or three minutes? What's changed for the better in the piece that you've now drafted? Smashing, thank you. What I would like you to do now is spend three minutes, again, looking at this piece and jotting down what you think possibly still needs some attention in what you've just written in the draft as it currently stands. What still needs some attention?
super. Thank you. Thank you. This second stage, the head draft, as I call it, can take an awful lot of time. Revision, you know, that common saw about writing being 90% revision and editing. It's really horribly true. It does take time to generate new material and get new stuff working for us. But actually doing this revision stage is a lot of work. And one of the things I was talking about to the kids on Saturday was that when they do exam questions, they only get a chance to write a first draft. They only get the chance to generate a single piece of creative writing. They don't get a chance to revise it or anything like that. It's just the first uh, stuff as it comes out of their head or their heart or their gut or wherever. We've got the opportunity to revise and to edit and muck around with our piece or pieces endlessly before um, we decide that they're ready. I've got a tiny piece in the Flash Fiction Festival for anthology last year. It won a, a competition, different competition, and then they said they would take reprints. And this is 200 words. I must have written about 25 drafts of it before I was completely happy. Did things like change the tense, change the point of view, added a new beginning, changed the transition moment two thirds of the way through, had a little bit of a crisis in there, uh, upped the emotional stakes, changed the closing, you get the idea. I changed a lot of it to get it to the final form. And that final stage when I was polishing really came in two parts. And I talk about this final, element of writing a piece um, that has two aspects to it. And the first aspect is where we are trying to make the unfamiliar familiar. And by that, I mean, whatever our piece is about, whether it's a tree's diary or um, the story of an egg from its moment of being laid to uh, flying um, off the top of the, the Campanile in San Francisco. I've been thinking about the, um, the peregrine falcons there quite a bit recently, or whether it's about um, the life cycle of a butterfly or whatever. In some ways, that is an unfamiliar narrative uh, for many of us. So what we're trying to do is make it familiar. Now, lots of storytellers, anthropologists, linguists, and folklorists have done masses of research on this, on what makes a certain kind of story familiar to us. Sometimes it's a particular character all across the Middle East and Central Asia. You have the character of uh, Nisruddin, who is a, uh, a little bit bumbling um, and a little bit um, not the sharpest tool in the, um, the drawer but is held in great affection. You always know when you hear a story about Nisruddin, there's going to be something, um, the wisdom of fools kind of stuff that you're going to learn from it. Likewise, stories that start once upon a time, we know how they go. They're kind of linguistically coded into our brains now. And similarly, there are different forms across the globe which um, have verbal patterns that are familiar to the audience who are listening to them. Even if it's only very faintly, they just remember it somewhere, maybe these days from television or film or radio. Now, different people in different contexts have done some smashing analysis on what these underlying plot types are. are. And there's a guy called Blake Snyder, who's an American, uh, was an American screenwriter, who talks about 10 basic plot types and Christopher Booker, um, I love that he's called Christopher Booker, that's just fantastic. He writes about the seven basic plots and a friend of mine called Dave Thorpe thinks that there are actually only four and others are just variations on that. But these plot types are what makes certain things feel familiar and comfortable and set us up for a certain kind of expectation in our relationship to what we're reading or seeing or listening to if we're an audio book listener. And I'm not gonna put them all into the chat. Some of them will immediately become familiar to you. There's things like rags to riches, um, 
dealing with the overcoming the monster in the house. Jurassic Park's a great example of that, the monster in the house, not quite in the house, but nearly. Uh, rites of passage stories, uh, rebirth, the full triumphant, those sorts of stories, the quest, um, right from Jason and the Argonauts all the way up to, to modern day versions. Why done it? Not who done it, but why done it? Why they did it? Um, dude with a problem. Did I already say that one? Where something has to be overcome. Um, riches to rags. So rags to riches, riches to rags. Um, all of these different forms are almost instantly recognizable to us. And when we're writing a story which seems to be about something else entirely, some of these universal plot types or themes can be incredibly useful in helping influence the shape of what we're writing. So that what is unfamiliar at a subconscious level to our reader or listener feels familiar in some way. And the piece that I wrote, which is in this little book, it's 200 words and what's the time? 12 minutes past. I'm tempted to read it to you just simply because it's a great example of um, one particular plot type uh, and it's a piece of nature writing. Um, it's only, no, it's 12 minutes past, but I haven't really got time. But what it does is take something um, which is just a fairly standard story and makes it deeper and richer, which is what we're trying to do with this third stage of the heart draft. So that's the first aspect where we make use of existing plot types to shape the narrative further. Now, I mentioned about having the structure, the beginning, the middle and the end with these transition, transition points of the inciting incident and then the crisis, which is resolved. And that means, and it sounds terrible when you're trying to get a plot type and a structure to braid together, but with practice, that can be really effective where you have a narrative shape that is reinforced by, if you like, a narrative message. Now, the other part of the, um, the other aspect of a heart draft is when you make the familiar unfamiliar. So I've already talked about the unfamiliar being familiar, but now we're talking about the familiar being unfamiliar. And that's all to do with the language that we use and using imagery and rhythm and sensory detail and observations and motifs and the shape and so on, making that work in an interesting way. I am going to read this because it's got some great language in it, which also I worked really hard on <laughs> to get the language right, my God. Okay, so this is called On Summer Wings. It is the winter of my father's life, but he says he is still a summer lad. We sit on a stone bench cushioned by moss, faces lifted to the cloud colandered sunlight, eavesdropping on the bee whispered gossip shivering the foxgloves and comfrey bells. Dad pulls a notebook from his pocket and checks he's jotted down the purple tufted fetch that frames the care home's postcard lawn. His ink threaded lists of flora and fauna are a rosary of yesterdays, a prayerful recital of familiar names, Swift, Martin, Swallow, welcome dogfight flybys that once punctuated the sweated gray of wartime tenement slums, a swooping joy that still scrambled to intercept his night fret dreams. Shadows lengthen, midsummer is past, and the days shorten inexorably. There's still a grace in the churched candles of the horse chestnut, even as they go out one by one. He passes me his notepad for safekeeping. No finger rays are observations this week. He taps his chest, a slow rhythm, echoing his failing, stuttering heart. He struggles to his feet, apologising, ready for a cup of last year's hedgerow tea. This winter-worn man, almost done. Then, high above us on summer wings, there is a red kite, soaring. And we watch 
until it's gone. And that's it. It's 200 words, but it's got some great language in it. I, I feel absolutely no hesitation in being proud of my own work. This is something that's really important. If you like something you've written, be pleased with it. I'm dead pleased with that because some things, the rhythm of the language, purple tufted fetch. I wanted something that was duh, 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 duh. I didn't want something that was duh, 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 duh. I paid attention at that microscopic level to the rhythm of the words. Regularly, I will look at a particular sentence and think, is this bouncing right? Does it resolve at the end? What is the rhythm? I will walk around the house reading pieces out to see if I have got it so that it lands with a plum, rather than landing and not quite ending or not resolving. And I don't think I'm especially musical, except when it comes to getting the rhythm and the bounce and the sound and soundscape of a piece um, effectively done. Now, this is a piece of creative nonfiction because it's about my dad and I sitting in the garden of his care home. And he's a deer, he's 94 now, and he's collected um, lists of the birds that he sees and the flora and fauna um, every year. He's got a notebook every year of his life. And when I first wrote that piece, it was kind of interesting, but it was a little bit, like I was saying about the archeology span thing, it was a bit predictable. It was about me and him going into the garden, having a look around, sitting down and then coming back in and drinking a cup of tea. It's not great, really. I mean, it's nice, but the underlying plot type, it's a bit like the voyage and return. We've got something that feels a bit more universal than just somebody going into the garden and coming back. It's also a little bit the fool triumphant. He has a terrible heart problem and yet he still wants to walk around the garden and see things and hear things. It's got a nice open lean line. It is the winter of my father's life, but he says he's still a summer lad. And we use the language right towards the end and come back to that again. So that kind of symmetry is also something really effective in terms of language. It's got some nice sensory detail. It, the cushioned moss, things that we're all familiar with and that we would all, if we walked around a garden and were asked to really pay attention, we would do that. It's also doing things like using verbs more interestingly. It's got all, I think it's got no adverbs in it. This is the other thing at this stage where we take out some words like very and just and actually and really and that. Most adverbs can come out. Make your wor verbs work really hard for you. The verbs should be working really hard for you. Sometimes we can verbify nouns and nounify verbs as well. And by that, I know sometimes um, if we turn a verb into a noun, you know, things like um, uh, a gift becoming gifted. Was it gifted to? Oh, it can be too much of a shortcut, but sometimes it's incredibly beautiful and effective. And this is what I mean about making the familiar unfamiliar, the, um, the rosary of yesterdays, the bee whispered gossip, the, um, the, the foxgloves and the can't forget bells. Again, that was da da and da, da da da, getting the rhythm right. So just to reiterate, this heart draft stage is about making the um, familiar a story about my dad feel uh, the unfamiliar, just a story about, you know, somebody, no, none of you know him, he's unfamiliar to all of us, but making it feel familiar by using a universal plot type uh, to resonate with people. And that's what we want people to resonate with our work and to relate to it. And to move beyond this thing that sometimes nature writing is a bit gu guilty of, where it's just about fact or what we feel about the fact. Occasionally we get into, what those feelings mean to us or mean to all of us or should mean to all of us. And if we're fortunate, we go one layer deeper and it's about a universal sort of sensibility and understanding and relationship with the piece and whatever the piece is talking about or describing or 
inviting us to, to um, come into relationship with. And then the second part of the heart draft where we think about, you know, can we make the language even better? Can we make it better? Can we make it more interesting without it being too purple? That's a bit of a borderline. Somebody said to me, you know, I think you've really pushed it. It's good to have one really interesting um, thing per paragraph. And I think I've got seven paragraphs there and I've really pushed it as far as I can. And in that central section, which has got the swallows and the swifts and the wartime stuff and the motifs of the dog fights and things like that. And then the swallows scrambling at the, that keeping that motif to one paragraph rather than threading it all the way through means that it doesn't feel too overdone. Now, I've recently had feedback on a 7,000 word chapter and somebody said, um, one of the editors said, I love this, but you've got to dial it back a bit. It's, it's present tense, it's a bit relentless because it's too beautiful. And I thought, damn it, it's too beautiful. So I've gone in and made it a bit plainer in places and taken out some of my glorious um, evocations um, because it's a 96,000 word book. If you've got 96,000 words of glory, that might be a bit much, a little bit much. Anyway. When I got to this point of um, getting close to the end of that particular piece, I asked myself a really important question, which was, this was in about two drafts before it reached the final version that it is now. And the questions that I asked myself was, whose story is this? Because I think at that point in the draft, it was my story, not my dad's and I needed to make the shift so that it became much more clearly my dad's story. And the second question I asked myself once I'd rewritten it to be his is, um, what's this story about? What's this piece about? And then I wrote underneath it, what's it really about? Now, normally I do this what we've done in 90 minutes over a five week class where we're looking at these three different core things, the gut draft, the head draft and the heart draft. We do one week on each of those and then we have a, a beginning session and we have a, a final session. And in the final session, the kind of things that we're talking about are where are we going to send our work? What are we going to do with it? Now that we know what we think this is about, what it's really about, is there any further revision we need to do? For that exercise, the what is it about? What is it really about? I normally ask people to answer at one particular question seven times, which is at the heart of my story is a simple message about X, Y, Z, and then they have to answer it seven times. I'm gonna give you that as one that you can do afterwards. At the heart of my piece is a simple message about. And answering it seven times differently helps you get to the core of what it really is. And when we're in the heart draft stage of a piece, that's what we're trying to do, get to the core of what it is, the heart of what it is, so that when somebody reads it, it, it meets their heart too. And I think that um, I'm very good at being unemotional about stuff but I want people to respond to what I write from the heart as well as the head and the gut. I've got five minutes left. I just want to say something about some of the submission opportunities. If you're someone who likes to write um, for a submission, then there are several things coming up um, that are really, really perhaps good to know about. The first is that Country File, have their Nature Writer of the Year competition coming up on the 8th of June, and that's 600 to 800 words about a special place. Um, on the 1st of July, Quiet Man Dave competition, which is non-fiction, 500 words, is coming up. The uh, 11th of July, if you're in Wales and disabled Disability Arts Cymru, their creative word competition is coming up. 24th of July, uh, the National Geographic 500 word 
traveler travel writing competition is coming up. Uh, there will probably be a Sound Walk September thing at the end of, uh, towards September. Um, and if you're a working class writer, then the Working Class Writers Festival will almost certainly be launching a new Nature Writer Prize, um, probably in June, I expect the deadline will be August. Okay, we're coming up to the last four minutes. If you submit work, there are three really important things to do. Follow the guidelines. <laughs> That's the most important thing. Lots of people don't. The second most important thing is use a title. 60% of people who submit work to competitions don't put a title in. Use your words, don't waste them. It's a fantastic opportunity, make sure you use them. And the third thing is to remember a really important thing, which is what is the best that can happen? Because if you don't submit, you don't know what will happen. Where if you do, anything could happen, who knows? And I think sometimes it just takes a little bit of encouragement to, to encourage somebody to, to get their work out there. Two years ago, I submitted my first piece of work. Uh, I'd never, some of those competitions are free to enter. Some of the competitions have got, um, uh, will uh, give you free entry if you ask. Uh, there's several that uh, when I was financially extremely hard up, I asked and they gave me a free thing without any question at all. They gave me free entry, which was fantastic. At the time we were struggling and they were great. They were totally super, um, but some of them are free. Um, I think Country File is, and I know that the Working Class Writers one is as well, and uh, Disability Arts Cymru one is as well. Um, yeah, two years ago, I hadn't submitted any work, just over two years, and now I've had 188 publications, 13 wins, and 80, 80 pl competition placings. I didn't know what the best that could happen was. I'm an okay writer. Sometimes I'm great, but sometimes I'm just okay. And that's, that's okay, I, you can get better all the time. You've been wonderful and have worked really hard over the last hour and a half. If you've got the start of a draft or even a bit of revision, I really hope you will do some further work on it and think about where you can submit it. Andrew, I'm gonna pass back to you and your magnificent hat, which I like very much. All right, well, that was fantastic. I took loads of notes. Um, the good news is that there is going to be a recording of this. Uh, as you know, we recorded it.